The first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 3. By the end of the book of Isaiah, the Hebrew people are out of exile, and the author declares with assurance that the people have a new name for this new time. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and the salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The second lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. Luke's Gospel account of the life of Jesus also includes the story of the presentation of Jesus in the temple, one of every Jewish family's rituals regarding a firstborn heir. There were people present who recognized him not just as an heir to his earthly father's household, but also his extraordinary lineage as the Messiah they were waiting to see. And now, Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought the infant Jesus up to Jerusalem, present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord and they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and the mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At the moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the prayer of God was upon him. I love in Luke's gospel how Simeon and Anna wander on stage, have their little scene, and then disappear from the gospel. I find that humorous. I realize I'm a little peculiar, but I, I find that humorous. Now, from a literary point of view, Luke is doing something here. Luke is making it clear what the identity of Jesus is. Simeon looks at Jesus and sees the Messiah. 
Anna looks at Jesus and sees the redemption of her beloved holy city. <clears throat> Luke is, again, making it clear that God is up to something big. After Mary Joseph and Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, learn that God is up to something big, the next people to know that God is up to something big are some shepherds. Jesus, Luke tells us, was born outside the control of the empire, born among the animals because there was no room in the inn, that he was born without an address. And the first people the angel tells this good news to are shepherds, people who live in the fields with animals who don't have an address. This story continues with Mary and Joseph being observant Jews, taking Jesus to the temple. They go at the appointed time for ritual purification and to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and commitment. And there in the temple courtyard, we know that they're in the temple courtyard because women are present. There in the temple courtyard, two people, a man named Simeon, a woman named Anna, recognize and name Jesus as the one they'd been waiting for, the one who would be the reconciliation of the people. They are the next to know that God is up to something big. It's in the midst of the ritual at the temple that Simeon calls attention to Jesus. He adds his prediction that the rising and falling will happen as people encounter an inner transformation when the inner thoughts of many are revealed. Anna, who has a decades-long practice of coming to the temple for prayer and fasting, a practice that might have begun in her grief after her husband's death, though that's pure conjecture on my part, seems to embody the transformation Simeon speaks of. She raises her voice at seeing Jesus, speaking to anyone who will listen to her. I like how Bruce Epperly describes the scene. Here in the temple courtyard, a new order is declared. It is an order in which hope abounds and shouts of joy are fully appropriate. The old order is passing and a new age of beauty and justice is upon us. There are hints of the age of Aquarius. Those who are of a certain age know what that's a reference to. Uh, and if you're not of that age, then maybe a new emergence is happening. Today's scripture. Humankind is on the verge of a quantum leap of awareness Yet, though we have matured ethically in many ways, we still have a long way to go. The world is about to turn. All one need to do is turn on the news to know that we have a long way to go, continue to mature ethically. The wars in Ukraine and Palestine, Israel, make clear that we have not learned the ways of peace. And if two wars are not enough to convince you, there are at least three other wars happening in the world today where over 10,000 people have died just in 2023 alone. And if five wars with that many deaths is not enough to convince you that we have not learned the ways of peace, one need merely turn to the work of the Geneva Academy, uh, an academy of international humanitarian law and human rights, which is currently monitoring 110 armed conflicts worldwide. It doesn't take much to know that we haven't matured ethically. One can turn on the news and notice that every month since May has been the hottest month ever recorded. And today is the last day of the hottest year ever recorded, probably the hottest year in the past 125,000 years. And just to get an idea of how long 125,000 years is, agriculture has been around for just the last tenth of that time. Democracy is under threat around the world a threat largely taking the form of white Christian nationalism here in the United States. 
Far too many leaders are ignoring the Christian prophetic vision, adopting a preferential option for the wealthy, not the poor, disregarding the economic and personal pain of so many. Amid our national uncertainty, writes Epperly, and our willful disregard for the common good at the highest levels, we wonder, will we ever experience this age of shalom and wholeness that we read about in the scriptures? Will we ever, as a society, love justice more than power and profit? Will we ever privilege the vulnerable over the rich and powerful? There are days when my answer to those questions are an unequivocal yes. Absolutely, we will experience that day. We will, as a society, love justice more than power and profit. Some days it's an ambiguous, eh, might. And there are days I find it hard to hope at all. Now, my dear friend, the late Lizanne Bassham, adopted the nickname Pollyanna of the Apocalypse because she was able to find hopeful signs in the midst of disaster and destruction, in the midst of chaos and confusion. We tend to misuse the word apocalypse. We typically use it to mean a disaster and destruction that would bring the end of things, the closing of the age. In fact, the word apocalypse means unveiling or revealing. To be a Pollyanna of the apocalypse is to be someone who can see the hopeful signs that are being revealed in disastrous world events. I find myself pondering if I can see any hopeful signs being revealed in in today's disastrous events. And it's been a struggle for me to see hopeful signs The Russian military forces are still in Ukraine, and the war rages there. Meanwhile, the protests in the streets of Russia have disappeared. It's hard to find signs of hope. Hamas committed a terrible act of terror against Israel, and the Likud-led government continues to respond with total war in the Gaza Strip that looks like ethnic cleansing to me. There is no righteousness on either side. It is hard to find signs of hope. COP28, the 28th annual international gathering of people who are supposed to do something about climate change, was held in the United Arab Emirates this year, in a oil-producing, oil-centric country. And the chair of the COP, was Sultan El Jabbar, who is also the head of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. I had little hope that an agreement would come out of this COP, let alone one that actually moved the needle very far. And my low expectations were met. And yet, And yet, the needle that is pointed toward support Israel right or wrong, no matter what, seems to be shifting. And more and more people are saying that whatever government leads Israel, it must abide by international law. And yet... Some people are awakening to the threat posed by white Christian nationalism. Yes, there are many who embrace it, and at the same time, there are many more and more people calling it out as a false Christianity, as racist, as anti-democratic. The fact that the former president of the United States, a former president of the United States, is facing 91 criminal counts is a sign that our democracy is still there, even if he was able to use those indictments to raise money. And I heard on the radio this morning that Poland's authoritarian government has stepped down 
and did a democratic government is now in charge in Poland. Their judicial system has been decimated. It's going to take a lot of rebuilding. But there is a sign of hope. And though the agreement that came out of COP28 was at best weak tea, it did include one sentence calling for, and I quote here, transitioning away from fossil fuels in energy systems in a just, orderly, and equitable manner. Now, Bill McKibben acknowledges that may not seem like much. It is, after all, the single most obvious thing one could possibly have said about climate change akin to, in an effort to reduce my headaches, I'm transitioning away from hitting myself in the forehead with a hammer. <laughs> but it is, and this is important, a tool for activists use henceforth. The world's nations have now publicly agreed that they need to transition off fossil fuels. And that sentence will hang over every discussion from now on, especially about discussions about any further expansion of the fossil fuel energy system. There may be barriers to shutting down operations. What the text of the agreement obliquely refers to as national circumstances, pathways, and approaches. But surely, if the language means anything at all, it means no opening of more new oil fields, no more new pipelines, and no more new liquefied natural gas export terminals. And guess what? A coalition of environmental groups are acting now to pressure the Biden administration away from new natural gas, liquefied natural gas terminals, especially a project called CP2. CP2 is a $10 billion export terminal proposed to be built on a marshy stretch of the Louisiana coastline. If built, CP2 would lock in decades of additional greenhouse gas emissions, the main driver of climate change, and it would be harmful to the people who live in the area, as well as the fragile ecosystem that supports aquatic life, in the Gulf of Mexico. In the coming months, the Department of Energy is expected to rule on whether or not this export terminal is in the public interest. That's the vague language that they're supposed to make their permitting decision on. Is it in the public interest? And thanks to the one sentence in the COP28 agreement, the Biden administration has reason to say it, it's not in the public interest. There are two themes that I hear loudly in today's gospel lesson. The first is to see with Simeon and Anna's eyes to see the holy when it is before us, to notice God in our midst, even when all seems hopeless. The second is to be present with the assurance that Anna and Simeon held, that God is at work through us and through others to increase love, to bring reconciliation, to embody justice and peace, to turn the world around. As we enter a new year, I want to have the vision of Simeon and Anna. I want to be present with those who are suffering in the way these spiritual elders were present. I want to be present with assurance. I don't know what causes someone like Simeon to live with assurance that he will not die until he's seen the Messiah. I just know it has something to do with faith. And I don't know how someone like Anna came to practice a life of prayer with the assurance that it will make a difference and help bring about the redemption of her nation. I just know that it has something to do with faith. What I know for sure is that I want my presence with you in the new year to be grounded 
that kind of assurance. Amen.